Exploring North Carolina asked noted scientists to share their thoughts about climate change and sea level rise that may affect North Carolina in the next 100 years. Here in North Carolina, of course, we're between the tropics and the poles, and so we have an intermediate level of predicted climate change. Something on the order of five to nine degrees Fahrenheit change increase in mean annual temperature in North Carolina. And that would be associated with a rise in sea level of around 18 inches along our coastlines from the melting of polar ice packs. There's no question that sea level's rising foot, foot and a half a century right now. And that will continue. There's a very high probability that that will increase. Today, keep in mind that two major factors will affect our climate in the decades and centuries to come. First, changing temperatures and a rising and falling sea are nothing new for North Carolina. We are still in the cycle of cooling and warming known as the Ice Ages. Second, beginning about 200 years ago, at the dawn of the Industrial Revolution, humans began adding significant additional carbon dioxide and other gases to the atmosphere. Unchecked, increasing amounts of these so-called greenhouse gases will affect future climates and sea levels. To have a good idea of what future climates hold, we need only look at the past with geologist Dr. Stanley Riggs, distinguished professor at East Carolina University. Dr. Riggs is a prolific author and the recipient of numerous awards and fellowships. As Stan Riggs took us on a unique tour of Ice Age coastlines in North Carolina, it was clear that few people possess his energy and drive to understand the past and present. In the long history of the Earth, we've had four major ice episodes on the surface of the Earth. We happen to live in the last one, the last one that has started about two million years ago and consists of at least 20 or more glacial, interglacial episodes. A glacial episode is a period of time when the global climate cools. And as the global climate cools, the, the processes of evaporation, precipitation uh, on the Earth's surface change so that the water is evaporated out of the oceans and precipitated on land as glacial ice masses. These glacial ice masses are up to over two miles thick. Um, they frequently cover the northern half of North America, the northern half of Europe, and these, these to get two miles of glacial ice stacked up on land requires a tremendous volume of water. And that volume of water, the only source for that much water on the surface of the earth, is uh, the oceans. And then as the climate warms, as we go into the interglacial period, uh, we heat up the atmosphere, the glacial ice masses begin to melt and recede by melting, and the water goes back into the oceans, and as it happens, the oceans rise, and the ice leaves the continents over here. So it's like a teeter-totter. Stan emphasized that during the glacial periods, North Carolina was not covered by ice, and that the closest glacial ice was in what is now Northern Virginia. But the great ice sheets had a profound effect on North Carolina's coast, and these Ice Age cycles are still with us. We are in the interglacial now. The climate's been warming for the last 16 to 18,000 years. It's been warming not um, regularly, it's been quite irregular. It's been coming up and up and up, but it doesn't just go like this, it goes like this. And there's cycles upon cycles of warming and cooling. It's sort of like the stock market, where you have an, an hourly cycle, a daily cycle, a weekly cycle, a monthly cycle, a yearly cycle. Well, the ocean does the same thing. The climate oscillates like this. But there's a net trend that's this way. No question about it. And it's been coming up for the last 16 to 18,000 years. It is still coming up today. It's coming up in North Carolina at the rate of a foot to two foot per century. Um, and it is producing our estuaries, our coastal system as we know it. 
Stan showed me a map that clearly shows a rising sea level and a westward migration of the Outer Banks over the last 150 years. He also took me to an Outer Banks location where a rising sea has now exposed old peat beds. Tom, this is a peat block, and this, this is formed in, a, in an estuarine marsh behind the barrier island. It formed back there in that kind of an environment. But this didn't come from back there. This came from the, from the shore face during a storm. It eroded out of the shore face. And the island was out there, and it has moved back, migrated back across the top of this, leaving this out here exposed in the shore face. It's eroded out of the shore face, gets kicked up here on the beach. That, this is absolute evidence that, that these islands are moving. At other locations, far to the west and above present-day beaches, Stan showed me shorelines from North Carolina's past. We can ask the question about how do we know that sea level was higher in the past? And we can tell that, first of all, by the morphology of the coastal plain. And if we start up at the fall line, which is the edge of the Piedmont, and we look at a geomorphic or uh, a topographic map of North Carolina, uh, we can see that we have a ramp up here that drops off stair steps down to a terrace down here and then another one and it stair steps down to another ramp and the, the entire coastal plain is made up of a series of stair steps. And when we take a close look at these stair steps, what we find is at the, at the boundary between this terrace here and this scarp, we have a beach deposited here. At Stan's research sites, I saw quarries, bluffs, and terraces, where clearly defined beaches were marked by marine shells and coral beds. We visited the Suffolk Scarp, a 125,000-year-old shoreline that can be seen from space, and the Waconkomo Terrace, overlooking the Chuan River, where evidence of ancient oceans in warmer times towered above our heads. How did this happen? This can only happen if we have higher sea levels or if the land has been rising and sinking, but the land doesn't move up and down very easily. What does move up and down easily is the ocean. And the ocean moves up and down in response to glaciation and deglaciation. There's another part to this system that's really important, and that's the riverine valleys. When, when we're in the interglacial periods, and sea level is, is moved across the uh, upland portions forming these new shorelines, they flood up the river valleys to produce our estuarine systems. And they, if we're 20 feet higher than today's sea level, uh, the estuaries would flood up the river valleys uh, to an elevation equivalent to 20 foot higher than they are today. And so they'll reach way back across the entire coastal plain, almost to the Piedmont. And when we occupy the uppermost uh, shoreline, they may even extend as far as Raleigh. Stan and his multi-talented colleagues have collected deep river sediments through core sampling and compared the data with information obtained at bluffs and in quarries to put together a complete record of coastal rivers and the entire flooding process. We know exactly how the, the river evolved into an estuary, from an estuary into a marine system. We know the, the timing, we know the sequencing of that event. That helps us understand what the sea level was doing and what the climate's doing in this whole process. How does a modern discussion of rising CO2 and the greenhouse effect fit into this old story of rising and falling seas? Stan told me that geochemists have analyzed ice cores that reach back over 800,000 years. These cores hold detailed records of CO2 and temperature. As you go back in time and you plot this, you end up with a temperature curve that goes like this. And then if you plot the carbon dioxide or some of the other gas curves alongside this, they also go like this suggesting that there's an, a direct correlation between CO2 and temperature. And this goes back all the way to 800,000 years ago now. And it's a perfect record until you get up to about 1780. All of a sudden, the CO2 composition 
takes off. And thing about 1780, plus or minus, is the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. To find out what effect increased CO2 and other greenhouse gases may have on North Carolina and the world, I went to Duke University, where I met with Dr. William Schlesinger, author, professor, and dean of the Nicholas School of the Environment. Dr. Schlesinger is also a member of the prestigious National Academy of Sciences. I asked Dean Schlesinger to explain in simple terms what is meant by the greenhouse effect. The analogy for the Earth and Earth's atmosphere derives from carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, a variety of gases that allow sunlight to pass in from outer space, uh, warm the surface of the land and the sea, and those warm surfaces give off heat radiation that is very effectively trapped by those same gases on its way back out of the Earth's atmosphere. And so the atmosphere gets warmer. About 200 years ago, when the Industrial Revolution began, of course, that was powered by fossil fuels. Humans discovered that you could uh, burn them in industrial and personal usage. What that has done is to raise the carbon dioxide in Earth's atmosphere from about 280 parts per million, so out of the typical level that it was in an interglacial period, to today's level of about 380 parts per million. So we've added about 100 parts per million in Earth's atmosphere in the last 150 years. In talking with our experts, we found that during glacial or cold periods, CO2 levels typically fall to 180 to 200 parts per million. The interglacial periods or warm periods show a rise of CO2 to about 280 parts per million. Since scientists have found much higher levels than 280 parts per million beginning with the Industrial Revolution, what does this bode for our future? As scientists observed that carbon dioxide was rising in Earth's atmosphere each year over the last 50 and 100 years, there's been great interest as to whether that increase in carbon dioxide would lead to faster plant growth around the world. We began to test this hypothesis with the FACE experiment in Duke Forest about 10 years ago and we fumigate replicated plots of the forest with high carbon dioxide uh, year round, 24 hours a day. We are adding 200 parts per million carbon dioxide on top of the daily uh, measured value because that's the amount that the Earth's atmosphere is expected to have 50 years from now. Our plots are replicate plots of the forest of the future and we look at tree growth and water use and insect abundance and decomposition, all the kinds of things that make a forest function. I toured the Duke site with researcher Jeffrey Pippin and saw an amazing outdoor laboratory where tests are conducted on every aspect of forest growth. I asked Dean Schlesinger about his findings at his experimental forest. Of course, what we were most interested in with the FACE experiment in Duke Forest was how much the trees might change their growth rate in response to growth at high carbon dioxide. And over the 10 year period, we've in fact seen about an 18% increase in the growth of the pine trees. It's varied year to year depending on temperature and precipitation, but that's the average over the course of our experiment. I think it's interesting to note that not all plants are uh, right at that average of 18. Uh, that applies to the pine trees of the canopy. Down in the understory, down on the ground where you and me might have a casual afternoon stroll, there's a lot of poison ivy. And poison ivy has been the champ in this forest. It's shown about a 70% growth increase uh, over the course of the experiment. So the forest of the future may have its trees growing a little bit faster, but I think one thing we can expect is a rank understory of poison ivy. Some of the other things we've noted have been an increase in the production of pollen and seeds by the pine trees, which has some human health uh, impacts that I think we should be alert and, and uh, concerned about. William Schlesinger explained how the additional CO2 being added to our atmosphere by the burning of fossil fuels will affect North Carolina directly. 
The best models of the climate of the future, these are called general circulation models that predict the conditions at the end of the current century, predict the greatest warming for the planet at the poles during the winter and at night. They predict actually modest changes at the tropics right around the equator. Here in North Carolina, of course, we're between the tropics and the poles, and so we have an intermediate level of predicted climate change. Something on the order of five to nine degrees Fahrenheit change increase in mean annual temperature in North Carolina. And that would be associated with a rise in sea level of around 18 inches along our coastlines from the melting of polar ice packs. I could not help but wonder if the effects of global warming are already being noticed in the Arctic, where temperature change will be the greatest in decades to come. I had the privilege of visiting with Mike Dunn, Director of Teacher Education at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences, who had just returned from an amazing journey. I recently had an opportunity to spend a month on a Russian icebreaker in the Arctic Ocean. The purpose of the Arctic expedition uh, was primarily physical oceanography, and I had the privilege of being with scientists from seven countries that have been studying the Arctic Ocean for some as much as 30 years. And over that time, they've seen a lot of changes in the Arctic sea ice. 30 years ago, the average depth of sea ice uh, was probably three to four meters, 10 to 12 feet thick. Uh, now, the average depth seems to be about uh, one to two meters, so we're looking at uh, you know, three to six feet. Uh, which is still seemed thick to me, you know, having never seen sea ice like that, but to realize that it's reduced in thickness by 40% in the past 30 years, that's a significant change. You know, why should someone here in North Carolina be concerned about something that's happening in such a remote part of the world that so few of us know anything about? And we had the opportunity to ask uh, several of the scientists that same question. And to a person, they all said, well, you know, what happens in the Arctic doesn't stay in the Arctic. The Arctic is a critical part of a global system of both uh, ocean currents, atmospheric circulation. So what happens there can have dramatic effects on the rest of the world. And it also is sort of a, a precursor, perhaps, to changes that all of us are going to feel. In my meetings with scientists and researchers, I wanted to know more about the changes we can expect in North Carolina in the decades and century to come. Dean Schlesinger filled in some blanks. A warmer world, such as predicted here for central North Carolina, five to nine degrees Fahrenheit warmer than today, even if nothing else were to change, is likely to be a world in which the climate is drier. Rates of evaporation will increase off the soil, off of streams, off of lakes, and essentially produce a more frequent and widespread uh, conditions of drought. These are the kinds of changes that uh, compose what we call extreme conditions. Uh, climatologists often talk about how a high carbon dioxide world of the future will produce extremes of climate and drought is, is one of them. A warmer world is also likely to increase the occurrence and the ability of various uh, insects and pathogens uh, to occur in places where they may not occur today because of cold winters or low uh, night temperatures. Uh, some of those insects are certainly capable of carrying human uh, diseases and this offers of course a whole set of health questions. A warmer ocean surface is very much linked to a greater intensity of hurricanes uh, and, there, and extremes of stormy conditions uh, which of course here in North Carolina we will see borne out on our coastal communities. Along the coast of North Carolina, I think it's very reasonable to expect an inward migration of the ecosystems. What salt marsh today may very well be flooded with rising sea level, and you can anticipate, well, salt marshes will occur slightly higher up on the landscape, and uh, so on and so forth as you get further and further from the coast. In our mountainous regions, uh, at the highest elevations, uh, we find what is called boreal forest adapted to cool conditions, short growing season. And as the climate warms in those areas, uh, one would have every reason to expect that those communities would migrate upwards in elevation. Of course, the problem is that the mountains have a finite height, and to the extent that the upward migration occurs, they may 
uh, push themselves right off the top of the mountain. And uh, of course that means we'll lose those communities in North Carolina. This means that such boreal forest trees as Fraser fir, red spruce, and mountain ash may find it difficult to compete as temperatures warm. Also, the animals that live in these forests may not be able to adapt to changing conditions. I'm standing at sea level near the Pamlico Sound. A century from now, experts tell us that sea level will be higher and the climate will be warmer. Most scientists now agree that as individuals, states, and nations, we should significantly reduce our carbon footprint, the amount of CO2 that we release into the atmosphere. We were not surprised, therefore, when our experts also reached similar conclusions about the way we should plan and build infrastructure in the decades to come. As we prepare for a warmer climate of the future with global warming, which I hope is not terribly much warmer than today, but I think there's every reason to expect that we're headed to some warming. I think it's important to think about all the other things we do and plan on a daily basis that make our society operate. Where you put a road, where you put a shopping center, where you put a hardened structure along the coast uh, to protect a beach, all of those will be there for 50, 100 or more years. And many times, we have put those structures in place without regard to the need for plants and animals to migrate to new habitat that uh, will occur as, as the climate warms. Uh, and uh, we want to make sure that we don't essentially f uh, cement in, in a very real sense, uh, barriers to the migration of natural ecosystems. Finally, we ask our friend Stan Riggs, who knows the dynamics of sea level change as well as anyone, what issues face us in the years to come? There's no question that sea level's rising foot, foot and a half a century right now. And that will continue. There's a very high probability that that will increase two, three, four feet per century, maybe even five feet by the end of 2100. If that were to happen, Eastern North Carolina's got some serious problems ahead of it in that we've got 10 to 12, maybe even 15 counties where over 50% or all of the county is less than five feet above sea level. If we're gonna manage and evolve into the 20 uh, to 2100 uh, in a realistic way, we have to start to think about how are these ecosystems gonna respond? How are they gonna migrate upslope if we harden all the shorelines? How are they going to migrate up, up the river valleys if we build road dams across the, the river valley and stop the process of flooding up these valleys? We have to consider how we build, how we take care of our waste in these areas, where we dispose of our waste. We have to take care of our future water supplies and groundwater systems. And, and this has to be, has to be a, an active part of our planning and our management program now, not in 2100, not 50 years from now, but now. We have a changing dynamic system, and if we're going to evolve with that system and maintain a viable coastal system, then we have to let that system evolve and grow just like you'd let a child evolve and grow with time. We have to back off of some of the hard stands that we've taken with respect to our present approach to coastal dynamics.